Okay, so we had an excellent camp, as I said. We've got a video that's available just to give some of the highlights. I'm sure that everybody has their own highlight from camp. It was a real blessed camp where we saw 170 people get together, a lot of pastors, uh, a lot of great testimonies, a lot of great items. I think for me, it was amazing how we had to keep going no matter what came against us. And so as we were on our way there, cars break down and, and uh, you know, Ziba wasn't able to make it at the last minute and then cars break down. And then uh, thankfully, Mike's not here. I was going to acknowledge him. He came through and rescued Carlton and Lee to make sure they got to the ferry. And then Magdalene and Angie and we we managed to just pray and say, we're going to camp. And we got there and it was really worthwhile, except that on the first night, Angie got very sick. Didn't you, Angie? And so we had to pray. We had to have faith. We had to believe that God would not uh, prevent Angie and Magdalena and certainly Jocelyn, who was quite involved in ministering as well, from, uh, from a, a good time at camp. So we prayed, everything cleared up, thought, great, no problem. Except the next night, as I'm about to uh, to bring the word, the ambulance shows up and Jocelyn and Pastor Ben and then eventually Pastor David from uh, from Fresno end up uh, praying with Angie. And then I went in and Angie was taken by ambulance. But we believed on faith that Angie was going to be okay. And by the time we arrived, what happened, Angie? All, all gone, right? Right? Were you healed? Yes, Angie, you can say yes. Amen. Right? And so Angie got healed. Now, of course, there's a lot of discussion. Maybe it's too much. Maybe Angie's sick. It's a lot for Magdalena at the camp. Maybe we should go home. But at the end of the day, we said, no, we have to be here for the Lord. And a lot of people prayed. And uh, next thing I know, and she's giving her testimony at camp. She's playing in the band at camp. She's singing a song in front of everybody at camp. Ah, Mary, heart, right? Yeah. And you can take a look at that video. Wasn't that wonderful? Stephanie did a great item. We had our collective item. Ziba finally just said, that's it. I got to go. And you had a wonderful time. So it was it was a great time. Certainly, we were thinking of those that uh, that weren't able to make it, uh, especially those on Zoom. And and we've got the dates for next year's camp. So start putting a little bit of money aside, and then it, or tithing, and we'll you know we'll take care of it on deposit, and then we'll have everything ready for you. And then next year we'll all be there. And that includes hopefully some people on Zoom will make it August 4 to 11 are the dates of the camp. And it, you will not regret it. Private Lake with fellowship, activities, wonderful food is certainly something to consider. Amen. All right. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit again. Uh, you know, Stephanie kind of did this by request. She wanted to know about the sun standing still. And I thought about it. And as we kind of look at things and we've taken a look at things, we've got an incredible miracle filled Bible that is full of God's promises and truth. And they really happen. I've told you this before that C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien were sitting around one night talking about story writing. We all like stories. We like, maybe we've heard of The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe or Lord of the Rings. So these are the authors and they're talking about writing their fantasy books. And as they're sitting there chatting with each other, C.S. Lewis said to Tolkien, he says, you know, that's the thing is that uh, what we write is, uh, you know, we've, we've got all these adventures and fantasy and and uh, they're wonderful, moving stories. Then we got the Bible, and it's a collection of amazing stories that are written down for us to learn from, to uplift, edify, correct, direct, and help us out. Okay, all scripture is inspired, God breathed. Amen. 
Bible means, what does Bible stand for? Basic instructions before leaving earth. Basic instructions before leaving earth. Because ultimately, we're just tourists. This is the camp on earth. And eventually, we're going to rise and meet the Lord in the air. So as C.S. Lewis related this to Tolkien, he said, the stories in the Bible are full of passion, adventure, excitement, injury. Ooh, what's going to happen? We don't know. Hang on. Stay tuned till next week's episode. The difference between what we do and what the authors in the Bible do, it's true. The same adventures, the same excitement. So as we look at the story of you know Abraham, the friend of God, leaving his family and saying, no more idols, no more this, no more that. I'm going to the promised land. He's on his way to the land of Canaan. He arrives in the land of Canaan, and there's all kinds of adventure, Egypt back and this and that. And then finally, there he is. He has his children, uh, Jacob and sons. And then there's Joseph, who gets taken off to Egypt, put into jail, becomes the right hand of Pharaoh. And God has a plan that he would eventually raise Joseph up to second in all Egypt, the prime minister of all Egypt, so that Joseph could prepare things so that when the, the children of Israel or Jacob and sons were starving in a famine-laid land, they could come down to the promised land and God had provision for them. Now, we can take a look at that story and we can go, well, that might be Mother Goose or it might be uh, this or that or some sort of fantasy fairy tale, but I believe it really happened. And I believe that we can take encouragement from that story to know that God never leaves us or forsakes us. He will not leave you orphan. And that's the beauty. Nobody here needs to ever feel alone or abandoned. And we look at it. We look at Abraham, made a lot of mistakes. Isaac made a lot of mistakes. Joseph made some mistakes. And God say, that's it, you're not worthy, goodbye? Not at all. The whole thing was the message of hope that eventually Moses would be raised up to lift up the children of Israel out of Egypt. And on the way to the promised land, they're coming out of Egypt and the horse and the rider are coming after them. Help! Why did you bring us out here, Moses? Oh, no! Weren't there enough of graves in Egypt? You brought us out here so that they could kill us and slaughter us. Moses kind of went, Oy vey, didn't you just see all that stuff? Stand and see the glory of the Lord. And the seas parted. They went through like the waters of baptism to see the repentance and the sin and death and the horse and rider thrown into the sea. So there they are, there they are, guided by the pillar of fire and the cloud, and then they got nervous. Only Joshua and Caleb were faithful enough when they came to the promised land. We could take them. We could take them, right? Come on, we can get them. The adventure, there it is. And everybody went, oh, no, 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 no. hang on. We're, we're not ready. So God said, fine, 40 years in the desert. Now they got the law, they got the covenant, God provided them manna, supernatural happy meals, baconators in the desert came down magically. It was like, whoa, wow, this is pretty good. <laughs> you know, didn't have to do drive through at that time, Rob, but there it was. They got the food provided for them. And onward, finally, to Jericho. Now that's kind of an interesting one. And again, hopefully a lot of these stories, people here or people on Zoom, you understand and you can look them up as we go through the book of Exodus into Joshua. They come up to Jericho, kind of an interesting thing. Okay, I want you guys and girls and everybody, I want you to walk around the city of Jericho silently for one day. So there are the instructions. Walk around Jericho one day 
silent. Okay, tomorrow I want you to do the same thing. You're going on a big hike. Everybody marching, we're marching, we're marching along. And then finally on the seventh day, I want you to do it seven times. And, and on the seventh time, blow your trumpets, blow your horns, and suddenly the walls came tumbling down and they got the victory. So now words out, God's people are coming. And there's sort of a last ditch effort. The five kings are, are coming against them. And you read all of this in Joshua and it's adventure. It's like, okay, this is it. The children of Israel are coming in and the sin of the Canaanites that had been left unrepented for 400 years was now being judged. Now in talking, I'm just going to put a pin there for a second because on the talk this morning, as I was witnessing to this lady, why does this happen? Why does this happen? Why does God let this happen? Why does God let children be taken into slavery, suffer? And in this case, the children of the Canaanites were being offered to pagan gods. Murder right before a pagan god. I'm going to bring that up there. We'll beat the drums loud enough so that the mothers couldn't hear their babies screaming in pain as they were offered to the god of fire, Moloch, and you know, of course, the ancient uh, pagan gods or demons, if you would. And so now God is saying, all right, we're going to clean things up here and we're going to set things right. This cannot go on unchecked. And the Can Canaanites are going to be absolutely and utterly destroyed. So the final push is on. And now Joshua is praying for a miracle. He needs some light. So if we go to Joshua 10, let's read the adventure here. Joshua 10, if you have your Bible, open your Bible, or just flip a few pages and make me believe that you're looking into your Bibles. <laughs> or just look because Anthony put it up there on screen. Now it came to pass when that guy there, king of Jerusalem, had heard how Joshua had taken I, that's not AI, artificial intelligence, but I, and had utterly destroyed it as he had done to Jericho and her king. So he'd done to I and her king and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them. They feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city as one of the royal cities and because it was greater than I and all the men thereof were mighty. So wherefore Adonazak Dek, king of Jerusalem, sent unto Horam, king of Hebron, and that king and that king, and they all got together saying, come, in verse 4, up unto me and help me that we may smite Gibeon, for it hath made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. Let's take these people out. We had a covenant. We were going to stick together, and now these guys have broken ranks. Let's take them out. Therefore, the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, uh, the king of Hebron, the king of Jamuth, the king of Last year, the king of El, El Galan gathered themselves together and went up, they and all their hosts, and encamped before Gibeon and made war against them. The men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp of Gilgad, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants. Come to us quickly and save us and help us for the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Josh Joshua, fear them not. That seems to be the buzzword. Fear not, for I am with thee. That's something for each and every one of us. When we go out into the streets, when we go into our workplaces, our study sessions at school, wherever it is, Fear not, for the Lord thy God is with thee. For I have delivered them into thine hand, therefore shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. And the Lord discomforted them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them along the way that goeth before Bethron and smote them into Asia and Makedah, 
Yeah, for anybody that's into video animation, uh, that would be a good sort of role play sort of thing where you get the armies there, there they all are, and then Joshua and God just kind of like scatters them and they and they win. Wouldn't that make a, a neat little video? Think about that for your homework assignment. Uh, anyway, and it came to pass in verse 11 that as they fled before Israel and they were going up in the Bethron that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them in as as kai and they died they were there were more which died from the hailstones than they whom the children of israel slew with the sword that's the beauty of it is that god always wins the battle we don't have to fight our own battles we just have to be faithfully to serve the lord put him first so then spake joshua unto the lord in that day, and the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves from their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? That's uh, an interesting ancient book from the son of Caleb, uh, lost to antiquities. Not in the Bible, but there is other books. So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about the whole day. And there was no uh, there was no day like it before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Now, that, that's kind of an interesting one in that well, what just happened there, of course, it took until 1992 for the Catholic Church to admit that Galileo was right and that the earth went around the sun. And for the longest time, they had said that, no, 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 the earth is the center of the universe and the sun goes around it because of this verse. So what happened scientifically? Is this metaphor? Is this otherwise? It's an interesting thing. As I was doing my research on it, I believe this miracle really happened and that God has the ability to do these things. Of course, we know scientifically that it's just the earth stands on its axis or it slows down or there's some sort of a, a time loop there or there's some sort of reflection or mirage that, that allows that to happen. But when you go back through some of the ancient texts in other cultures and other uh, peoples around that area, there is recorded a day that was two days long in other cultures. Those are, are written about, and we can look that up sometime if you are interested. It's just one of those things that you look at and you go, wow, how did he do that? That doesn't make sense. If you stop that, would gravity take over or maybe we missed it or whatever? Let's just say that God provided a mighty miracle the sun and the light lasted double the time. So if you get eight hours a day, maybe you had 16 hours a day, and it was enough to prevent the Amorites from regrouping and launching a counteroffensive or escaping and then getting into guerrilla warfare against them. So it is quite miraculous, and that's the, the power of God. But does it mean that that verse there means that the the sun is the is the center of the universe or the sun rotates around the universe it's observational when we talk about the sun rising even to this day we say the sun rises in the east and it sets in the west we look at that and we see that mathematically and scientifically we know that the earth is rotating on its axis 23 and how many degrees anthony 23 and a quarter, 23 and a half, somewhere in there. Yeah. And that allows the seasons, etc. God put the earth on its axis so that we could do that. But how many people here are center earthers? Anybody a center earther? No. We understand that that the uh, the earth travels around the sun and the axis rotates and etc. But let's just say that that is recorded there. Now, there's another miracle that relates to the sun, of course, and that's in Isaiah 38. Isaiah 38. And we'll just go through it a little bit here that uh, if you turn to it in your Bible, 
or you look at it. We got Hezekiah. There was some great revival under Hezekiah, but suddenly he gets sick and and uh, you know the, it, it looks like that's it. Time to get your house in order. You're going to die. He says, but I don't want to die. Well, we don't get to choose the time. We just get to, you know, follow that. But he, he said, really, 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 I don't want to die. Please, please, I'm not ready to go. So God said, all right, we're going to give you a reprieve. We're going to allow you to have your, your revival moment where you get some extra time. And we're going to set a proof in the sky that not like... Uh, Joshua making the sun stand still or appear to stand still, but we're going to make the sun go back in, in time. And if the sun can go back uh, a little bit in time, that would be an incredible miracle. Sun goes backwards. It's like it's... Anyway, we'll get to that. So in uh, verse 1, in those days, Hezekiah was sick unto death, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, set thy house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face towards the wall and prayed unto the Lord and said, Remember, O Lord, I beseech thee. Now I walk before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which was good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Then came the words of the Lord saying to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days 15 years. Hallelujah. You get an extra Hezekiah blessing. You're on your deathbed. You get raised up. We're going to give you 15 more years because of your service to the Lord. Hallelujah. That'd be good. Maybe to die is fine. You rise and meet the Lord near. To live means there's more people that you can talk to about the Lord. Okay, and I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and will defend this city. And this shall be the sign unto thee from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he has spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees, which has gone down in the sundial of Ahaz, 10 degrees backwards. So the sun returned 10 degrees, by which degrees it was gone down. Another mighty miracle. Incredible. How did that happen? Obviously, the earth rotated backwards for a period of time, and something happened. Now, how do we know that, that this is actually true and actually a recorded thing? Well, once again, uh, th there was something a few years ago where NASA actually had the calculation of days, but it turned out that that was actually a hoax. It didn't happen. So if you ever search this on the internet, it still might be out there about NASA having computed that this and that happened and and they, they were able to record it. But it's not actually true. So just be aware of that and don't quote that or share that around. But in 2 Chronicles 32 and in verse 31, Second Chronicles 32 and 31, kind of an interesting little quote here, that this sign in heaven was quite big. Obviously, the people in Israel aren't going to be the only ones seeing it, or in Judah aren't going to be the only ones seeing it. It's going to happen around the world, and somebody else is obviously going to, hey, what just happened? You know, was there an eclipse? Did it get dark? What, what, what happened? And so, as we see, how be it in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land, God left him to try him, that he might know all that was in his heart. So, we see that the Babylonians, who were quite known for their astronomy, and of course, astrology, etc., and... Uh, close to where Zeba's from, Iran, Iraq. That's where they're from. And so they come there and they go, hey guys, what just happened? Something happened. You know, there's signs in the stars, signs in the moon, signs in the sun. The sun just went back. And all our calculations are out. 
So explain to me what just happened. And so we see it recorded here. We see it recorded in Babylon that this actually did happen. It was a miracle. Now, the interesting thing is that whenever you use, <laughs> we, we hear that, it's always the plot of a movie, right? Whenever you use magic, there's consequences. And so whenever these things happen, there's consequences. The Babylonians come in and they go, hey, what just happened? But while they were there, they're kind of looking around going, this place looks like a good place we can expand into. And eventually, as the kings of Israel and Judah continued to delve into more and more sin, this point set up the doorway for Babylon to come in and take them out eventually, as we see in there. And of course, other signs in the sun and the moon and the stars, the birth of Jesus. I don't have it recorded, but the birth of Jesus, a great star was seen so that the men of the East, again, Babylonian, Assyrian, and, and people from Ziba's land, they go, hey, wait a second, there's a big star here in the sky. And it was so powerful that even the pagans just went, hey, we better pay attention. Something big just happened. And so it's going to be when the Son of Man returns, as you remember my talk from camp, there are going to be signs in the sun and the moon. You know, the moon will be turned to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Look up, my redemption draweth nigh. We were driving around yesterday. And what did we see, Stephanie? We saw the sun. It was like a blood red sun up there in the sky, in the smoke and in the haze. And wow, it was powerful. It was like we were in the middle of the, the apocalypse right now, the final battle. And these things will happen. The fires will come. The signs will be there. The eclipses, the blood red moons, the super moons. We don't worship the sun, the moon, and the stars. We worship the Lord our God. And we know that he sent his son to us, that whosoever believeth on him, trust him, rely on a dear to you will be saved. You will have that opportunity that through the waters of baptism, you could repent of your sins. You can receive the Holy Spirit speaking in other tongues. You could know that the salvation of the Lord is yours. Being born again of water and of the Spirit, that you have that assurance, that blessed assurance that you will rise and meet the Lord near. What a beautiful day that will be. Now, as we look around, of course, we see different signs. We often have a saying here in Canada, and it's taken out of the Bible. Of course, this, this was to shepherds in the Middle East, but we talk about red sky at night, sailor's delight. Have you heard that saying before? Red sky at night, sailor's delight. Red sky in morning, sailors take warning. That means uh, for you people from Ontario or people that aren't from the coast, maybe it's, you know, that that the shepherds or the people that are watching over their flocks or the people that are watching over the herds, it's the same thing. If it's a red sky at night, we know it's going to be good weather in the morning. If it's a red sky in the morning, uh-oh, here comes the storm. It's an interesting thing. It hasn't let me down. Whenever I've looked up, I've seen that. But Jesus talks about it in Matthew 16. Matthew 16. And of course, those wonderful people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, we see that all the time, even today, that there's always somebody coming in, not trying to learn, but trying to teach us or trying to tempt us, trying to uh, trick us in some way. We always pray for the wisdom of it. And it's beautiful to watch the words of our Lord and Savior as he goes through and he kind of schools these people. So the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came tempting, desiring that he would show them a sign from heaven. Hey, come on, Elijah brought down fire. Moses gave us manna, right? We told you about the supernatural happy meals. Just put, throw some manna down. That'll be good. You know, the, the, you know Jesus probably could have said, would it be good if I did a card trick? Is this your card? 
right? Suddenly made a, a box appear or suddenly I got some flowers up my sleeve. Would that be impressive for you? The fire from heaven thing, I get that. Do you want that? Maybe just wipe out the Romans, but that's not what I'm all about. I'm not here as a magician or a trickster. I'm here as the Lord and Savior to tell you that you can be free from sin. So in verse 2, he answered unto them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red, red sky at night, sailors delight. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. Oh, you hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the sign of the times. It's a wicked and adulterous generation that seeketh for a sign. And there shall be no sign be given unto you, but the sign of the prophet Jonah, or Jonas as it's written here. And he left them alone and departed. And quite an interesting and powerful statement right there, prophesizing he would be three days in the belly of a fish. Well, we know three days in the belly of the earth, he would be crucified whipped and beaten for our transgression. He would die a horrible death. And everybody that said, I'm with you till the end, I'm with you till the end, would say, I don't know him. They would scatter, leave him all alone. So if you're ever feeling alone, abandoned, well, Jesus understands you. He understands because Everyone that said they would not leave him or forsake him walked away at that moment. Even his father, while he was on the cross, my God, my God, why is thou forsaken me? Quoting the Psalms. But it was really a point that for that moment, that separation had to happen. And God couldn't even look, have his face to look upon his beloved son so that all prophecy could be fulfilled right down to, I thirst, and they gave him bitter gall, and then he said, it's finished, and gave up the ghost. The powerful, true, recorded history that we can look at in the amazing text of the Bible. The greatest book ever written, the bestseller to this day, 180, 200 languages, yeah, try reading the Bible in Klingon, if you can imagine that. Uh, any Star Trek fans there will get that reference, but it is actually translated into that. It, it's kind of strange, but the point being that in the good King James English, we can look at it, written in the original Greek, the original Hebrew, God had a perfect plan that we could be here today. So now what manner of people ought we to be? we got to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Love the Lord your God. With what? All your heart. All your mind. All your soul. And then, of course, love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Do not show up to church saying, what can I get? Come to church and say, what can I do to build up and edify those around me? What can I do to honor the Lord today? Absolutely, you are going to be blessed. You are going to get a nurturing ministry, a wonderful time of fellowship, and in the end, eternal life when the Lord returns to rise and meet him in the air. But it's up to us, each and every one of us, brothers and sisters, as we see the day approaching, to take heed that the signs are there, the miracles are there. Praying for Angie and seeing her healed was a wonderful blessing. For Stephanie to come up in the prayer line and see, wow, suddenly I, I'm seeing a breakthrough. And there's so many testimonies and stories that I could stand here for hours. Right? I've only got 45 minutes left. Rob, what do you think? I'm kidding. Rob says, yeah, go. <laughs> But uh, as you know, I like to end it in around the 30 to 35 minute. So I will just say this. 
Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time to come to the Lord. Anybody watching this later on YouTube, I hope you heed the signs. And I hope that the loving God that never leaves you or forsakes you. Why are things happening? Because they will. But what is our hope? Our hope is in Jesus. Our hope is in the blessed Redeemer that gave us a comforter. And our hope is in each other, in the fellowship, brothers and sisters together. We'll leave it there. All the people said.